Coming up on Techzilla, Destructoids here with the word on what games you'll be lusting after from the Game Developers Conference. Rob's going to help a viewer build a music video jukebox. We talk matte screens for HDTVs, 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi, the best way to scan photos, and oh boy, is there one broadcast engineer that's a little ticked off with HD Nation. So put down that celery and find the veggie that don't crunch. You're going to want to hear what we got, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by Gazelle, the fastest and easiest way to sell and recycle your gadgets, Squarespace, and the Motorola Zoom. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Welcome to Techzilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Hey, whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or, well, I don't know. The best upper for an AR-15? Ooh, maybe. <laughs> hey, we've got an answer for you. <laughs> and if we don't, we'll track down someone who does, which is actually what we did in that case. In case you're wondering, my iPad is now getting $510 on Gazelle, or was at the beginning of this week. Is that good? Oh. Well, it, it, it was iPad beginning two, of the week. You know, it's today was a special day. I don't know. It's going to be interesting, and we will point out yes, Gazelle is a sponsor. Uh, we're going to be all hands on, by the way, with the newer, slimmer, faster iPad 2.0 we talked about last episode. In the next episode, and I just got to say, Viva la iOS 4.3! It returns, my beloved. What's in it? What's in it? Oh, don't let's not even get to that. We'll, all right, next week. Hey, if you're contemplating the iPad 2 versus the Motorola Zoom versus the HP Touchpad versus the BlackBerry Playbook. Check out iPad 2 versus Motorola Zoom versus HP Touchpad versus BlackBerry Playbook, the tale of the tape at Engadget.com. And if you're lusting for SATA 6 gigabit per second SSD reviews for the 120 and 250 gig Intel 510s, are all over the internet this week. Yeah, actually. Oh, uh, Nantec and PC Per both have really good write ups. Uh, let us know if you actually see either of these drives for sale anywhere, because the OCC Vertex 3 and, and the Intel 510 are like the, the newest, latest, greatest, fastest. They actually can use the 6 gigabit per second. Vertex. Uh, Go and Vertex. For, what did I say? No, no, no. Uh, no, I'm, I'm lusting for the Vertex. As are many I'm, other I'm, people. I'm drooling hard. <laughs> Definitely read the reviews before you buy, and oh boy, are those drives looking really good. 250 gigabytes in an SSD. When it's 250 gigs for maybe 250 bucks, I'll be a lot happier. Yeah, well, oh, with, it's actually with getting, the Sandforce technology, it's it's getting it's just, there. Kind it of, is sort of. Of course, a one terabyte drive is selling for 70 bucks at our local computer shop. Not and, an SSD. Uh, yeah, one and a half terabytes <laughs> for under 100, and two terabytes That's for awesome. 170 bucks. I, I I need a stack of hard drives. Oh boy, I'm running out of storage. Darn Bring video. on the mothership. Normally we'd get our first email question rolling right about now, but seeing as how the Game Developer Conference was in San Francisco this week, we had to get the scoop on the latest and greatest in video games that aren't Angry Birds. Joining me now to start doing host and expert in all things gaming, Max Scoville. Welcome to Techzilla, man. Nice to, nice to be on board. It's, you don't, it's exciting. You don't have the sort of usual third day of a trade show, dear God, help me take me home. Uh, a large burrito and a rock star have kind of <laughs> helped me out here. It's, it's been an extremely long week, though. I'm... Let's, 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 we'll boil it down so we can get you home to your bed as quickly as possible. I appreciate it. What's the what was the what was the number one story at GDC or, or what were the big stories? Um, I'd say game wise, the big deal was uh, Battlefield Three, mm -hmm. which EA was showing off. It's it's showing off the Frostbite Two engine, which photorealistic. I, it's the best looking shooter I've ever seen. It looks like. It, I didn't. I didn't realize it was in-game footage for a second. I was mm -hmm. like, "Okay, is this you know cinema scene?" What a lovely trailer! Can we yeah. get to the game? Yeah, the <laughs> but game, it's the actual game. Yeah, it's crazy. And right. um, I, I don't know when that's that's coming out sometime later this year. Mm -hmm. But they had a build set up for you know PC, and they're saying that this is going to run on something you can buy in a store. It's not like a, a crisis situation where you're going to have to go you know drop ten grand on a new computer. <laughs> um, but it, it looks incredible and. I got a lot of flack because everyone I talked to, all the gaming people were like, yeah, it looks really, really, really good, but it's a really hardcore shooter. It's Battlefield. Right. So, um, you know, we're, I'm waiting for something fantastic and ridiculous because, I don't know, <laughs> it's, you know, war in the Middle East. It's like, it's, it's, I like shooting guns. I like doing stuff like that. It's just, you know. It's a shooter. Rubble and, and dirt and stuff. It's like, I want, I want, some, I want to shoot unicorns or something. Ooh, I like I don't that. Know. I, like, I like fantastic Double Rainbow things. unicorn hunt. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> double You've Rainbow shot a unicorn, unicorn double hunter rainbows. with the Frostbite 2 engine. That's what I want to see. We should go trademark that immediately yeah. before someone does that game. Um, Iwata's Nintendo keynote. Yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, I don't know, a little bit underwhelming. Uh, mm -hmm. He's, let's see, uh, Netflix is coming to the 3DS. 
That's interesting. Um, Once again, Nintendo manages to avoid HD. First of all, well, let's yeah. talk 3DS. They the had 3DS, it in the yeah. booth, right? Um, I've seen it a couple times before. Game um, Boy 3D. I mean, that's yeah. pretty much the summary. It's it's weird. It works. You know, I say that much. Uh, the first time I tried it, I'm I'm six foot seven. That's I'm sitting down right now. Yeah. I'm I'm an abomination. <laughs> you're sitting down, so yeah. there's not a dark space above your neck where your head's supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but uh, they normally at, at you know at events and stuff they have the 3DS and it's kind of stuck on a table or just kind of right. down low. Um, for guys my size, uh, I, I was talking to one of, my, one of my friends, John Carnage from Destructo. He, he's like, you have to lift it up. You have to find the sweet spot. And, mm -hmm. and if it's on a table and it's like on a cord, you can't really do that. Uh, it looks great. The 3D is cool, but it's a gimmick. It's, right. It makes me think of the Wii. The first time I played the Wii, I was like, this is motion controller. This works. This is amazing. Um, but, you know, that got old pretty quickly. And it, that actually did something for gameplay. I right. think 3D is just a huge gimmick. And it's, you know, it's cool. It works to varying degrees. But... Um, I think a lot of people are with the 3DS. They, you know, this is just an excuse to replace all the Nintendo DSs. Yeah, a lot of people are just like, uh, I'm gonna wait two years and then I'm gonna get the 3DS Lite or the 3DSi <laughs> or whatever, the, whatever the next thing is. Um, well, the 3D is gimmick, kind of a theme for the show. Sony pushing the 3D. Yeah, you were a little disappointed with with Xperia Play. I was. Um, I think that Xperia Play is um, playing it. It. it it's a really cool phone. It's an incredibly cool phone, but trying to present it as a gaming device is just instant underwhelming. Mm -hmm. It just it doesn't work. Um, I, it feels like they were like, okay, um, yeah, Apple's doing the iPhone. We got to catch up. Let's make let's make a phone that plays games. And then they're like, oh wait, 3DS. We need to up the ante. Oh, let's make the NGP. What are we doing with the Xperia? Well, release it anyway. Just don't call right. it the PlayStation phone. Um, I, I think <laughs> didn't Nokia have this problem a few years ago with the Taco <laughs> gameplay phone? Yeah, it's just. I, 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 it, it was a nightmare. They, the thing got leaked. They didn't announce it at mm -hmm. CES. I was, I was sitting there with just, like, what was Sony doing? I don't know. Um, but they can, had, the NGP, they wouldn't even. They're still no hands on. It's behind a glass I've heard box. They in the middle literally of the show had it in behind inch thick, probably bulletproof glass, and it was just sitting there on a little rotating, you know, mirrored platform, and it was turned off. And it's, I mean, like. It cool. I've seen pictures of it right. in high res. Like this is now I've seen it non-functioning in yeah. in real life. I just I don't know what they're doing. I think it's the Game Gear of the future. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's the cooler version of what Nintendo's doing, but it's bigger and it's more expensive. Right. And what makes it that much better is kind of you know it's it's more fa fancier, higher res. Um, I thought the PSP was an amazing amazing handheld. That was amazing really cool. piece of hardware that yeah. I haven't touched in two and a half years. Yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm just I, NGP. I don't think that's even the official name yet. I'm right. not sure what they're going for. So I'm I'm just waiting to see what happens. But but any other games that that caught you as you're wandering through the aisles? Oh man, um, that, that you're allowed to talk about because they're not under God, embargo. um, embargoes. I I played the new Mortal Kombat. Mm -hmm. You're a big Mortal Kombat fan. Uh, I'm not a. I I was a you're, really okay. You're 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 big into gaming. I was gaming eight nostalgia. years old in 1994. I'll put right. it that way. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 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 that nostalgic thing, but like updating it without mm -hmm. feeling like it's just hackneyed or trying to... They, they kept the original gameplay feel, but they yeah, gave you amazing they, modern graphics. Yeah, they pretty much tried to... Um, the, the last, I don't know, five Mortal Kombat games, they tried to advance the gameplay and make it all crazy and right. high-tech, and it's like, I don't want that. I just want to rip out dudes' hearts and... Right. You know. They've got that, and it, that the three D on that looks yeah. Right. The three D on that looks amazing. That's mm -hmm. with the uh, the the Sony glasses that makes you look like Cyclops. Mm -hmm. um, it's cool because it's kind of a 2D game, mm -hmm. and with a lot of those games with the um, the shutter the glasses, the, the funky ones, um, they uh, watching over someone's shoulder. It just it looks like you're you know in a tequila drunk or something. It just right. it's all everything's blurry. fuzzy because it's not being yeah. processed. I could actually processed. watch people play Mortal Kombat. I don't know if it's the if the game itself or just the level of 3D they use, mm -hmm. but it looks good when you have the glasses on. It looks good when it has, has it off. The, the graphics are fantastic and the gameplay is fun. So I'm really excited about that. Um, is that your pick of the show? I don't know. Battlefield 3. Burger pictures? Time HD. Really? A classic, yes. I like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, a, Burger Time, you know, if you've, <laughs> if you've never played Burger Time, what a gameplay experience oh you're boy. missing. Oh, boy. Yeah, that was... People I, are now looking at the screen in horror going, yeah. like, what is that thing? <laughs> it's really... You are chased by food. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of fever dream you'd have after, like, a too much Korean barbecue or something. I don't know. Followed by tequila. The meat sweats. Yeah, it's just... It's <laughs> um... Was it? Was it? Did you get a chance to attend any of the sort of seminars? Or were you pretty no, much? No, I was. I was running board? around. I really wanted to, to see those. Um, 
there were some postmortems on classic games that I was, you know, dying to check out because oh, again, really? the nostalgia and stuff. I mean, GDC really isn't. It's not a. It's not a trade show. Right. It's a conference for people who are either in game development or want to be in game development. Uh, I saw a lot of a lot of young, like independent guys running around, just um, you know, trying to get get their stuff looked at, get promote promote themselves, and um, I root for that. You know, there's a lot of schools giving out pamphlets and. No one, no one goes into video game design because their dad told them to. Right. It's Usually, you're, you're going about. into video game design and your dad's not talking to you anymore. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well. well, we'll talk more about video game design and getting into that business maybe in the future. Yeah. Destructory.com is the website. GDC coverage is all over it, ladies and gentlemen. We want to thank Max. Don't forget to catch up in the world of video gaming with Destructoid. Everybody's at 3.com Destructoid, which goes along quite nicely with the website. I want to take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, Squarespace.com. We're talking about a, well, they call it a flexible solution. I call it an awesome way for anybody to create a blog, personal portfolio, whatever, a website. You want a website? You can't code? That's not a problem because Squarespace has amazing tools to let you create a high-end, complex website that is your own without paying out a lot of cash. Don't worry if you come across any questions at 2 in the morning because Squarespace gives every user 24-7 support. Now, we know a ton of you guys have signed up and built your sites with Squarespace. Now we're looking for your questions and tips for Squarespace. Do us a favor, email your questions or your tips about Squarespace to squarespace at revision3.com for a chance to have your question featured or tip shown off in a future episode of Techzilla. And if you don't already have a Squarespace site, go to squarespace.com slash techzilla. You'll get a two-week free trial and learn quite a bit more about how Squarespace builds your website, hosts your website, and just makes things really easy if you want to live on the web. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring today's episode, and do yourself a favor, or do us a favor, go to squarespace.com slash techzilla and learn a little bit more about how Squarespace works. Time to get our HD Nation on. Yeah. One thing we have to talk about, the iPad 2. Yeah. Dongle, 1080p output. Okay. I think I'm. I'm. I know this. I, I'm going to make a joke here. I think that that may have been a result of Steve having to step away from day-to-day -day operations. Otherwise, it would have been a 720p dongle. Is that cold or what? Oh, you Is mean it just, just wrong? It, it would only support 720p output? Well, no, no, no. It's kind of funny, right? Because kind of it has the new processor, and it's usually when you're talking about increasing resolution, it'll be more about it takes more horsepower to throw that kind of video out or decode that original file. I have an Apple TV yeah. connected to a 1080p television. Mm -hmm. I have a piece of hardware designed to feed my HD TV that is capped at 720p, and yeah. now I can buy an iPad that does 1080p out. <laughs> I, no, I'm stoked. I actually think it's great. Now it's I cool, just though. Have, uh, at first, it's, I was a little worried about dongles. I mean, I'm not a big right. fan of them, but if you look dongles at like suck. some of the mobile phones that are out there now that offer HDMI out, they're doing it with a micro HDMI yeah. adapter. So you got to get an adapter cable oh. anyway. All the mobile phones require some ridiculous cable you're never going to find. So if a dongle that goes to a full HDMI output that you can use a regular cable with, I think that's an okay compromise. Yeah, I think it is. It's just a solution. It's just so <laughs> funny to actually have like 1080p output coming from an iPad, not nice. the Apple TV. That, that, yeah, yeah. One way Apple users can get HD content in and yeah. out of their lives. And no Blu-ray yet, but there's your HD. Yeah, so. well, Steve doesn't Or your like 1080p, I should say. Yeah, Blu-ray might take away sales from iTunes. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> By the way, it was great to see Steve doing the thing on the stage, being excited. Any mention of iPhone 5? No, but I expect that will come in the mm. annual June iPhone refresh. My, my contract still has like a year and a half to go, so I'm waiting anyway. You know what? You are officially an iPhone addict. Jay writes in, as a person who works for a broadcaster, I was very sad to hear you say, call the broadcaster and complain last week. Oh. Looks like Gabriel was watching the History Channel. This means he was probably watching it via a cable or satellite provider. I recommend that he call his cable or satellite provider. I say this because cable and satellite providers can totally screw up the picture and cause the problem he was experiencing in the weird black and white artifacts at the top of the screen. I have experienced this personally as we once had an issue with our local cable provider where they were stripping out closed captioning. This went on for days until they finally admitted they installed a new box that took our HD signal and down converted it to SD. My guess, this is exactly what is happening. The History Channel is probably only sending out an HD signal now and the local cable or satellite provider is doing the down conversion to SD locally and causing this problem, Jay. I am sorry for implying that it could have only been that one solution, Jay. That's a, that, that's a well thought out response and I appreciate it. 
I'm, that makes me wonder, though, because History Channel's been one of the worst in terms of taking SD content and just stretching it and then broadcasting that as HD. Well, but now I'm wondering if they were even doing the stretching part, right. because uh, I'd say 90% of their, of their what they call HD content that you see coming out of there is literally, it's just everyone looks like Oompa Loompas. Which I, which I gotta say... It I, fills the screen, but it's, it's not HD. I, I was set I, in the corner. I was much happier with ESPN's HD that was SD with pillar bars. Yeah. Because at least the SD signal looks normal with the black pillar bars yeah. compared to SD content being stretched so it looks completely awful. Cool. So... Thank you, Jay. Call your provider as well <laughs> as talk to the engineers at the studio producing this content. Anyway, I'm just well, or, well, yeah, but that's also an interesting question. Do you talk to the the people shooting and creating the content, or the people at the network that is distributing the content, or the people at the you know I'd national or local level? Start for your cable where you're company? mailing your check every month to the person who's providing you with that content, and then work it up the chain from there. Work it up the chain. Mark writes in, I'm in the market for a new TV, and I'm thinking about the Samsung 46 inch 8000 series, Yummy. which, as you know, is an LED LCD. <laughs> yeah, we both love that television. Samsung also has the 7000 series, which is just LCD, but with a savings of 200 euros. That's about 400 US. Is the LED of the 8000 worth the price hike over the 7000 LCD? The two TVs are both 200 hertz. One is thinner, but that doesn't matter to me because I won't be mounting it on a wall. Thanks, Mark in Dublin, Ireland. Hey Mark, the primary difference between the 7000 and 8000 series is that the 8000 has a more advanced backlight system that Samsung calls precision dimming. Uh, the LEDs that are located along the edges of the screen can be modulated to dim the picture, or basically the pixels and portions of the picture, to minimize light, liquid, light leakage, which makes black appear very dark. Uh, essentially, if you can think of it this way, uh, because the LEDs are around the edge, right. and they can almost do like a two-dimensional cross-section, and where they both meet, they can gate the light right there so that if there's no, if there's nothing on the screen and it's supposed to be black, they can actually turn off all the light behind those pixels mm -hmm. and make it super black, so even in a dark room. Basically, the 8000 has better blacks, which doesn't Pretty sound much. like a big deal unless you're in a dimly lit room. Of course. Now, LCDs without some form of local dimming, basically the LEDs then act as a single unit and adjust the light output across the whole screen as needed. Now, visually, picture in your mind uh, some video content with lots of dark detail or just a screen showing video black. Now, if a small bright object enters the scene, a TV like the 7000 will increase the brightness of the entire picture. You'll see the whole screen kind of light up. The black well, goes gray. It, a little bit. <laughs> Whereas right. the 8000 can increase the backlight output just behind the, the bright object itself while leaving the rest of the screen and the dark details, well, pretty dark. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a subtle effect, but it, it is noticeable, and both TVs will give you a great looking detailed picture. The 8000 happens to do, like Pat said, black a little bit better. Now, if you can sacrifice 3D, Samsung C6800 series also features precision dimming but it just doesn't include the 3D stuff. So Ooh. that's another option rather than the 7000. But if you like the style of the 7000, that thinness, that's going to be pretty good. A friend of mine has a TV similar to the 7000 this year, and it looks good. If you're in a bright room, though, you know what? You probably won't be able to appreciate that kind of right. dark detail as much as you would. But if you watch a lot of movies at 2 in the morning, yeah, for the nice one. Go for the 6800. <laughs> Rick in second, the forum says it's time for a new display. I'm coming out of a five-year-old 60-incher with a matte screen. The set is in a room with a large windows, French doors, and for much of the day, a lot of light. It seems that just about all the new large screen sets have only glossy reflective screens. I fear adjusting to the mirror-like reflections may be difficult for me and my other half. Isn't that your better half? Are there any decent <laughs> LCD or plasma sets at that size with matte screens? Is there an aftermarket solution, such as applying a matte plastic film to the glossy screen? Or should I just get curtains or try to ignore the reflections? Yep. Hey, well, the main advantage of those glossy screens on the latest TVs, uh, it's essentially a filter on top of the LCD panel itself, is clarity. The light coming out of the screen is less distorted than it would be with a matte filter. If you could look up close with a magnifying glass, you'd actually see like almost blobs of plastic on that matte type filter. Uh, that they used to use back in the day. One tip I can give you to minimize harsh reflections is to stick with HD content and channels that fill the entire screen. The black letterboxing or pillar bars appear more mirror-like than active portions of the screen that are actually displaying something. That's a, that's a tip for anybody with any of these types of screens that can you know, just do that. Another tip is for daytime viewing in particular is to crank up the backlight system. Now I am not saying you should use the TV's dynamic or vivid picture presets, but the standard preset with the backlight set to maximum will produce a very bright picture that'll help counteract the light that might be uh, interfering with your viewing enjoyment. 
And also, every generation of LCD screens seem to do a better job at managing those reflections caused by ambient light sources. So today, those clear glossy screens are far less reflective than they were even a couple of years ago. And I'm seeing that it was really more of an issue with plasma displays because they had less light output. So they were coming up with some really interesting filter technologies that would minimize harsh reflections. Right. And that gets applied over to other display technologies as well. And they even do a demo. It's like, oh, here's our TV from two years ago. Here's our TV this year. And they'll put a lamp above it pointed right at the screen and say, oh, notice how less reflective it is. It's, and it makes a difference. It's worth wandering around your local big box store that has all of the televisions on display. And if you can like go through and turn them off and see how reflective the screen looks, then turn it back on. That's going to be a worst case scenario. It always. may surprise you how I, not reflective to, you know, bring a flashlight, you know, grab your flashlight, go into the thing and start shining it on there and see if you notice. It's actually kind of amazing sometimes how glossy those look when the television's off totally. versus how not glossy they look when the television's on. Keep that full screen video so you don't have those black spaces because the black yeah. really does turn into like a mirror when it's like, <laughs> or if you just turn the TV off, it, <laughs> you could pretty much do your makeup right in front of it or brush your hair. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> Blu-rays? Yeah. Hey, it's time for the new Blu-ray releases for the week of March 8th, 2011. First up, Exit Through the Gift Shop. This film is by and about the famous British street artist known as Banksy, or is it? It was released on DVD back in December and it's been available in the UK on both DVD and Blu-ray since September, but now we can finally see a Blu-ray release here in the US, although this disc is region free. With a 1080p MPEG-4 AVC transfer in a 1.78 to 1 aspect ratio, this release has both a 48 kilohertz 24-bit DTS-HD Master Audio 5.1 mix, as well as a DTS-HD Master Audio stereo track. And it's all on a 25 gigabyte Blu-ray disc alongside a DVD copy as well. Next up, The Walking Dead Season 1, a serialized zombie TV show from AMC? Yes, please! It premiered on Halloween last year, and if you missed it while it was on cable, you should definitely check this one out. It comes on a 1080p MPEG-4 AVC codec in a 1.78 to 1 aspect ratio with a Dolby True HD 5.1 track. High Def Digest says that it, quote, holds a pretty solid and impressive visual presentation to be from a super 16 millimeter film source, but it is very fitting as it adds the old horror film feel, unquote. This release is region A locked, and those six episodes are contained on one 50 gigabyte disc, while the extras are on a second 50 gigabyte disc. Extras include a five minute making of specific to each episode, a 30 minute making of documentary, zombie makeup tips, and much more. Also released this week, Four Lions. This British film is a black comedy about terrorism and premiered at Sundance. And while it got a wide release in the UK, it only got a limited release in the United States. This region-free single disc release is presented in a 166 to 1 aspect ratio and includes deleted scenes, mini documentaries about Muslim life in Britain, and an interview with writer-director Chris Morris and behind-the-scenes footage. And as always, check out our show notes at techzilla.com or hdnation.tv for the rest of this week's Blu-ray releases. Coming up, how to create a music video jukebox. But first, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Gazelle. Gazelle accepts more than 300,000 products from over 20 different electronics categories. Shipping is free on all items of value, and in most cases, they'll even send you a box to ship with. Also, for you green folks out there, Gazelle makes all the recycling partners adhere to some strict policies. No exports, no landfill policies, and a ton of data security standards. Gazelle is a great way to get cash to upgrade to the latest iPhone or Android phone. Just go to www.gazelle.com to learn more. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick. A free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week, Kindle for your Mac or PC. I know what you're thinking, that I don't have a Kindle. Well, <laughs> that doesn't matter. If you have an Amazon account, you can still download the Kindle software for your desktop and get access to all the same content Kindle users have. Whether it's one of their eBooks, many of which are free, their newly launched Kindle Singles, a newspaper, magazine, or blog, if you want a good way to read offline, check out the Kindle software. And if your friend has a Kindle book they'd like to lend you, you can now take them up on that offer. Plus, they have apps for iPhone, Android, BlackBerry, and Windows Phone 7 that will keep your progress synchronized across all platforms. So if you're not ready to dive into the whole e-reader thing, just get your feet wet with Kindle for the Mac or PC. Hey, let's go to a viewer question. Here's one from Guy. 
I would like to learn to use the Dvorak keyboard layout. No um, relationship to John C. <laughs> Dvorak. I need to point no. that out now. That cranky, cranky geek. I'm, uh, I'm intending to buy a keyboard and popping the, out the keys and rearranging them into the Dvorak layout. However, I'm concerned with the risk of damaging or breaking anything should I pry the keys out with my bare hands. Are there any good suggestions of how I should go about this task? Thanks. Regards, signed, Guy. Well, uh, you know, we up until today, we actually had a couple of keyboards stacked back here, but they're gone. I was oh. going to pop one off for you. Here, okay, for people who are going Dvorak keyboard, uh, DvorakKeyboard.com, Dvorak-Keyboard.com says the Dvorak keyboard is an ergonomic alternative to the layout commonly found on typewriters and computers known as QWERTY. QWERTY was designed literally by the original typewriter company that sold the original typewriter to Remington to slow down typists because the levers with the letters on them, aka the type bars, would snag on each other and jam the machine. So they literally put the most used elements, letters, the farthest away from the center of the keyboard. They made it incredibly inefficient. Dr. Dvorak, uh, or I should say Dr. Dvorak simplified keyboards, patented in 1936. He studied letter frequencies and the physiologies of hands as they typed. Um, and he came up with single and double-handed methods and a new keyboard layout that made typing much more efficient and therefore much faster and potentially less damaging on your hands. Might have taken over, but massive orders for typewriters around World War II pretty much crushed it, plus the fact that every typewriter in existence pretty much used QWERTY. Um, swapping keys really depends on the keyboard. Uh, yeah. Ergonometric keyboards tend to have very specific shapes with very peculiar angles uh, for specific areas of the keyboard, so you can't say swap the Y key for the T key. Um, the tilt on even regular square 104 key keyboards can be a pain, although some people seem to like the weird shapes. Um, key top puller tools, which you'll see sold on the internet for places that play around with keyboards, they, they work best on old school buckling spring keyboards, the ones that make the big ALP switch click when you press on them. Click, click, click. Some keyboards respond to having their keys popped off better than others. Totally. I've had you no know. problems with things like notebooks usually right. if you can pop keys off because they tend to be all the same size and they're all usually in a flat orientation mm -hmm. so you don't have to worry about that. You'd almost do it either with a finger or with a butter knife or something and pop right. them out. Although, I actually had a leftover cell phone repair tool that was really nice. It was a nice a thin, spudger. thin flat edge that I was able to spudger. hook under and pop it right up and those work well too. Somebody must sell Dvorak keyboards though. I have a lot of nerd friends, <laughs> nerds, who, uh, nerds, who use Dvorak keyboards. They, they swear by these things. They, I think they I just mean, like to be, you don't, they like to be different. You, well, you could also just go with a Sharpie if you have like a beige <laughs> keyboard and write the numbers and letters on there. Just, just shoot the thing in black and then just There actually <sighs> touch is type an it. all black keyboard, <laughs> sort of the super geek <laughs> keyboard. Type Matrix does Dvorak, key, uh, the Dvorak skins for their keyboards. Keytime, Kinesis, Fentech Industries, and oh, cool. Julian all do Dvorak keyboards starting at 19 bucks up to ridiculous prices for unbelievably amazing ergonometric bat wing keyboards that are designed to make you happier. Uh, keyboard stickers, by the way, start at just two dollars online. Oh, there you go. And and they, they masking look a little tape whiskey and a tango, sharpie. but yeah, masking <laughs> tape and a sharpie, also a little whiskey oh, tango. Probably feel a little funky. Lots of good info at dvorak-keyboard.com or uh, dvorak.mwbrooks.com. Excellent. Hey, next question. Rick writes in. I'm currently using an 802.11n Wi-Fi network in my home, spread across two access points, uh, Apple Airport Extreme and Time Capsule. It's set to BG compatible at the moment to support some older devices, but I'd really like this. Oh, but I really like the speed of a five gigahertz network. Will, the, will there be too much interference if I set up two Wi-Fi networks, one from each access point, one BG compatible, one N, even if I set them up on different channels? Thanks, love you guys. Signed, Rick in Los Angeles, California. Uh, well, no, right? Because 2.4 gigahertz, uh, the whole point of 5 gigahertz it is, is that it is not 2.4 gigahertz. It doesn't matter. You can have, you know, 5 gigahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, completely different bandwidth spectrums. Uh, the biggest issue with 5 gigahertz is that the range might suck compared to 2.4 gigahertz, but there's a lot less interference in 2.4 gigahertz. Matter of fact, I don't think 5 is really any faster than 2.4 gigahertz. It just has eight times as many channels and you know, basically everything, half, like, your microwave, 2.4 gigahertz. You, you cell know, phones, or not cell not phones, cell but phones. Uh, cordless, cordless phones. phones a lot of the gigahertz. early ones, especially. A weird, ridiculous, 
you know, just pretty much anything wireless that where they needed to dump it somewhere, they dump it at 2.4 gigahertz. Isn't that so part of the spectrum that was just they allow you to just to go ground. crazy? Yeah, dumping ground. So you could just yeah. make products that it's abuse open it. It's spectrum. It's unregulated spectrum. Yeah, that's the word I was thinking of. And especially, you know, you're in LA, you're in a big city. Everybody in your neighborhood is probably using 2.4 gigahertz, and and simply finding an open channel can help. My main concern, though, is that the 5 gigahertz sometimes doesn't do as well with walls, especially you know older walls involving lots of metal or mesh or anything like that. Look, try it. If you don't like the results, try flipping the B and G in the end to the opposite router and see if that works better, or try switching them to different locations in the house. Experiment. Um, you know, it, it's kind of amazing what you can do by moving things a few feet here and there inside the house. It, it's not awesome. going to cost you anything. Try it, try it, try it. Good deal. Now, a different Rick writes in, I'm looking for a way to set up music videos like I have my MP3s. I would like to have them uh, where I could do a random play while I play pool and have it play music and show the videos on a TV. I have a touchscreen jukebox for MP MP3s. Now it's time for music videos. Signed, thank you, Rick. Well, hey, Rick, if you have a PlayStation 3, you can enable sequential playback. That feature is located under the video settings menu. This won't give you random play. At least I don't believe it does. I uh, but it would allow you to play videos that are stored on the console's hard drive or on other storage media that's connected to it. And it would do it sequentially, so it would play through the whole collection. Likewise, there is a play all function in Windows Media Center's video library. I would imagine you could do it with a playlist in Windows Media Player as well. Again, I don't believe either option, though, offers a random shuffle mode for video. However, Video Land Client, or the beloved, oh, VLC does offer a shuffle mode for its playlist system, and given VLC's wide support of file types and codecs, it's probably the easiest way to go. Yeah. I was actually, it's like, I was like, of anything that could do it, that was the, that was, as soon as I if looked at all the other Windows options. If you have a giant videos, VLC will probably play any of them that don't have any kind of It's DRM right, right in its them. playlist, it's got a randomized button, and it's like, okay, that would probably work pretty well. And it's cross-platform, too, so. We love VLC. Coming up next, your suggestions for a portable projector screen. But first, we want to thank one of our sponsors, the Motorola Zoom. It is the first number one Uno tablet powered by Android 3.0, a.k.a. Honeycomb with a 10.1-inch HD widescreen display, a 3D interface, and one gigahertz dual-core processor. Fully flash enabled. I love me some flash. For video-rich web, no blank spaces. The web works. All of it with tabbed windows for multitasking and Chrome bookmark syncing. The Zoom includes Google Maps that you can tilt, rotate, and zoom into in 3D with PhotoReal Street View. Plus, the Zoom is 4G upgradable, so you can leap from 3G to Verizon 4G LTE and the mind-melting upper limits of speed. We're talking about a serious competitor for the iPad here. Check it out, folks. It's the Motorola Zoom. Film scanning? People still have film cameras? Uh, Colin writes, hey guys, I wondered if you had any advice or recommendations for choosing a negative scanner. I've tried to do some of my own research, but for every five-star review I found, someone else had a one-star <laughs> experience with the same equipment. I've seen that. I've been there. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not looking to spend a ton of money. This is just for converting my own snapshots into a digital format for easier storage and use. Mm -hmm. I've got boxes full of old photographs and negatives. Most are on 35 millimeter film, but some older ones are on 110 format, and even a few are on the apparently short-lived APS film format. Ooh. Thanks for any help you can give, signed Colin. Yeah, I actually, it's kind of funny because negative scanners are one of those things where there's, there's a very small but very serious group of users and and then there are people who sort of wander in and try them out, don't like the way things look, and, and the reviews on them online just, just Take them with a grain of salt. I, I went to our favorite camera reviewer, Lori Gruden, over at CNET, and she had an interesting response. Quote, I usually tell people to find a local service to do it for them. If you have a lot of negatives, scanning is incredibly tedious, and negatives are difficult to get right. If you only have a few, it's generally not worth buying the hardware. Colin, I, basically, you should check local camera shops for good info about here, you, uh, a service bureau if you're in the city is what you're looking for. Check with local camera shops. Uh, for info on a good place to do the scanning. Or you could try sending the film someplace online. North Coast Photo has gotten some love online from a bunch of people. Lori Gruden recommended Scan Cafe as having really good word of mouth, but she kind of was a little nervous. She said, quote, I can't bring myself to ship unique originals halfway around the world, but if geography requires you ship them off, I guess it doesn't matter how far they have to go. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I hear a lot of good things about Scan Cafe, but I personally have never tried it, although I agree with you. I'm not going to spend, you know, you can spend hundreds to thousands of dollars for scanning equipment. Mm -hmm. 
and you still have to figure it out, make it all work, and then hopefully get it all right, and then you know what? Then you're still stuck with the hardware. You probably won't need it after you're done. I'd rather have somebody who right. does this day in and day out, who has the eye for it, and, the, and arguably probably great equipment to take care of it, yeah. be able to take all that, get it back to me, hand me the discs or whatever format they're gonna put it on, and be done with it. Now, I would do that with video content too, like VHS tapes or I guess even I guess with like film content too, if you're trying to do that as well. Yeah, but, yeah I mean you can scan VHS. Yeah. Let's, let's not even get into the, let's, let, let us not muddy the waters on this one. Let's uh, not stick to negatives in film. Lori also mentioned that Scan Cafe recently dropped the percentage of scans you can reject without paying from 50% to 20%, but she figures it's still a pretty reasonable deal. And hey, there's always Costco where you can basically hand them a bunch of film and they'll hand you back a DVD. Cool. For like 20 bucks. Hey. It works for me. <laughs> hey, I asked, uh, I asked about portable screen ideas for our viewer with the new Pico projector and the Techzilla crew delivered. The ever so prickly Josh comments, I saw, the pro I saw the request for a portable projector screen and I fired up my Google Foo. Here's what I came up with. Well, obviously it's from Mitsubishi. It has a 30 inch diagonal screen size. Uh, matte white screen with a black border and pops up like the viewer wanted. It's available on Amazon for $180. Signed sincerely, the ever so prickly Josh. Yeah, 180 bucks and no picture of the item. That didn't exactly <laughs> inspire confidence in me when I looked at that one. However, John wrote in and he said uh, he found two more options, actually. One from Tiger Direct. This one had only a 1.5 gain and it was silver colored. I, I don't think that's reflective enough for a Pico projector, especially if there's any light at all in the room. And the silver color, it wouldn't... It, 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 it would help with the blacks. <laughs> or if it were 3D, I'd be like, you know what, that'd be a nice thing to try, but eh. right. The other one was from a Big Screen Center. It was a Delight's Demat. Now, I, I have no doubt that Delight makes a, a most capable screen, but it was almost 190 bucks. Well, this, this, also, this was going for a professional to be used for professional presentations. And so. you know what? And if it's a write-off and you need the extra zero on the end of the write-off, <laughs> Delight makes some fine products. I have no problem recommending them at all. And Brent writes in with the only one, really, I would recommend considering buying, especially if you're on a budget. Now, he writes, uh, Patrick, Rob, and Veronica, check this link for screens for the small portable presentations. The 30-inch Pico screen is $61. Thank you, Brett. And then, ah, the Elite Micro Flip screen, 17.5 inches, I think it's across, 4x3 screen, essentially. 55 bucks, though, with a screen gain of 7. <laughs> if you know anything about screen gain, that, that is some serious gain. That's, you that's might like want a, to keep your sunglasses nearby. A polished piece of aluminum, that's what that sounds like. But for a Pico projector, that's the whole problem. Is, is, it needs all the help it can get. Yeah, it, reflecting more of that light back will make the, project, make the picture look brighter. And that's really what you're trying to shoot for with a projector that has a, a dim lamp. Like those, not dim, but not bright enough like those Pico, Pico projectors do. As always, we thank the Texilla audience, a.k.a. the TZ crew for bringing the knowledge. Hey, for everybody watching, we live on your questions. Email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how tos You ask us, we'll do it. But we need those emails, so don't be shy. Send them into techzilla at revision3.com. Hey, even better, send us a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Please, just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us the link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash techzilla. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Robert Heron. Till next time, you've been watching Techzilla. High Def Digest said it. Welcome to this week's freebie download pack. Check out iPad 2 versus Motorola Zoom. Uh, what? Just read it versus. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs>